so this is a real treat because both Jonathan and Peter are, uh, are remarkably effective communicators when it comes to science and science-based problems. Um, and so we're going to sort of jump in. And I'm going to start, Jonathan, by asking you to give us a sense of the context uh, for the larger for the discussion we're going to have tonight. We've had a doubling of, of human populations in the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. What has that meant? Yeah, well, we live in a very, uh, well, let's say interesting time in all of human history. If you go back uh, through the, you know, archaeological record or so, something like a human being, our ancestors, eventually hominids, eventually us, something like us has been walking this planet for, I don't know, six million years, they tell us. That's like 300,000 generations. And during all of that time, one fact was undeniably true through almost all of that time. The Earth was big really big and we were very small what we did didn't have that much of an influence on the global environment but in the last two human generations or so that completely flipped around suddenly we became the dominant force on this planet and the earth now seems much 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 smaller and you referenced an interesting fact in the last 50 years the human population more or less doubled during that time just in 50 years at the same time, though, the world's economy grew eightfold, adjusted for inflation. So you get twice as many people, but doing eight times more stuff. And it put a lot of pressure on this planet, primarily through a tripling of global food demand, is huge, a tripling of global water use, and a quadrupling of global energy use in fossil fuels. I'm turning 50 next week. That all happened in my lifetime. And it happened in, um, you know, what's kind of amazing is not only did that outpace any other period in human history, it outpaced the entire sum of human history and human evolution combined in just 50 years. So that's the moment we've inherited. And it's the moment we're going to be passing on to our descendants. And so we have to make a choice now about what kind of planet we want to leave for the future. And what's happening in my mind is, you know, there are a lot of things happening, but the big ones are huge amounts of habitat loss and degradation, primarily from agriculture, water use, and indirectly through energy use. Uh, but also we'll hear more about wildlife trade and poaching and other issues from Peter, who's a world-renowned expert on this. But also now the specter of climate change, even if we do restore habitats, even if we do stop degrading land and water where critters live. And even if we stop poaching and utilizing them in unsustainable ways, the very nature of our planet is changing as well. So we've now inherited a, a so-called wicked problem uh, to deal with the future of our biosphere and the species we want to share this planet with and the kind of you know, planet we're going to leave our future generations. So, you know, this is it. Uh, people often ask me, like, is it a good time to be alive or a really bad time to be alive? Because there's some good things happening and some really bad things happening at the same time. And I just look at you and say, well, which one do you want? Because it's your choice. We actually have the agency to change the world. Uh, we have the ability to do this. Everything I just mentioned is solvable, but we have to decide to do it. And uh, that's the thing I hope we talk about today is whether we'll stand up and make that choice because it's one that'll affect the future of entire civilization. So let's take it from the global to the personal. Um, the uh, California Academy of Sciences mm -hmm. has something called Planet Vision, I mm -hmm. think, that yeah. gives us sort of concrete things we can be doing. I know because I've checked, I've, I've dutifully checked off the list <laughs> myself, <laughs> but con <laughs> concrete, <laughs> concrete steps we can be taking. Uh, there are students in the audience. Why don't you share those steps with us? Yeah, uh, thanks for the plug. Um, so yeah, we've developed, a lot of people will come to a museum or an aquarium or a zoo or what are these? which is amazing, by the way, museums and aquariums get about a 90% approval rating by Americans, whether they're Republicans or Democrats. We're the only thing left. <laughs> so shh, don't tell anybody, but we're still trusted. It's weird. Uh, so people would often ask us, uh, like, hey, I trust the place like a Cal Academy or the Exploratorium or Monterey Bay Aquarium. We have a lot of these great places in our neighborhood. And ask, what should I do to combat, let's say, climate change or ecosystem decline or the decline of our precious natural resources? And we said, well, there's a very long list of things we can do, but let's get started with the basics. And they were around food, water, and energy. We said, that's kind of the 80-20 rule of the global environment. A lot of the problems stem from how we use and produce food, water, and energy. 
whole bunch of other stuff too. We'll hear about others too. But if we don't get these right, we're not going to get it all right. So in food, for example, um, they're often the things that aren't so sexy, but they're very important. It turns out food waste is by far the number one problem in the food system. And we like to debate organic, GMO, blah, blah, blah. Food waste is actually the biggest problem because 40% of all the food grown on the planet and all of the land, all of the water, all the chemicals, all the wildlife displaced, tied to that, are wasted and never even eaten. 40%. And agriculture is by far the biggest thing we've ever done to this planet so far. So that's huge. That's 40% opportunity. Second, diets. Uh, eating lots and lots of red meat, uh, not so good for the planet. Um, less. I'm not saying absolutely cut it out, but cut it down. Uh, maybe a little less. Maybe put it on the side of the plate instead of the center of the plate. Maybe not every day. That would be a big help. And maybe grass-fed versus feedlot. That would probably be helpful too. So things like that. That's kind of what we're getting at. And energy, similar things as, you know, first, like conservation, kind of simple things, or heating, lighting, transportation, all things that'll save you money, make your life better. Then you can think about the Tesla if you can afford it or whatever. <laughs> and uh, same with electricity. Before you buy the solar panels, let's make sure you did change all the light bulbs and you know, um, make sure you deal with your refrigerators and things like that. So they're kind of simple steps. If you'd like to find out more, uh, it's planetvision.com uh, where we have uh, scientists who've kind of weighed in and said, you know, what are the first five things we could do around food and water and energy? And there are things you and I can do but there's a parallel track for it's not enough for us citizens to do it all by ourselves. We do need to do our part, but we also need business to do its part and we need policy making institutions to do their part in governance. And so we've kind of outlined in Planet Vision a level for regular folks like you and me and for business and enterprise level kind of decision makers as well as policy makers. And they're all tied together and based on science. But they're trying to be pragmatic and look for the biggest levers we can pull first and the ones that uh, kind of get us the farthest along. But it won't be an ex it's not going to solve all the problems, but at least get us going in the right direction pretty quickly if we put our minds to it. One thing you've said in the past is, look, we've got the, we, we have the knowledge, we have the science, yeah. we have the technology, we have the tools. Yeah. Um, what we need is a change in culture. So I wanted yeah. to turn, I'm going to ask you more about that, but I also wanted to turn to Peter because this seems to be what you've done uh, brilliantly. Is, is when it comes to, to the trade and, and wildlife and wildlife products, mm -hmm. is change attitudes first mm -hmm. and foremost, mm -hmm. uh, and then go at the other issues. What made you land on that? Well, I think, uh, first of all, you know, there's only two real environmental issues in the world, and one of them is population, and the other is consumption. And it's factors of those that ev affect every other mm -hmm. problem. And I would also say that probably the least sustainable consumption of all is using the rhino horn from the last northern white rhino or, you know, you can't get any more unsustainable than that. And when I started off working in this area, um, I do think it ultimately is going to depend on a culture change and an aspirational change of what we value. And I did think that it's hard sometimes for people to envisage climate change and these big, huge issues, but people can relate to, you know, there's only three of the species left or two of that and that's wrong and we're fundamentally doing something wrong if we get to that and I've had the experience of working all around the world and I've found in every culture people can understand and acknowledge that they may have different attitudes about animal welfare and things like that but they have the same basic notion that to destroy a species is wrong culturally and, and economically and every other reason so um, we got into uh, I got working on endangered species because uh, I was working with the Environmental Investigation Agency at the time, half the African elephants, this was 1989, half the African elephants had disappeared in the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. And nobody was even really talking about it. And if it had carried on at the same rate, then, you know, we'd be down to probably, uh, you know, a few thousand elephants left now. Uh, and yet nobody was talking about it. And clearly it was wrong on an economic point of view to do this. It was wrong on an ethical thing, but it was still carrying on. Uh, largely driven by greed and the want to make money from ivory trade. So that's what uh, first got me into this area of endangered species. And then doing the investigations, we were using undercover cameras and uh, fake companies to sort of infiltrate the wildlife trade uh, at both ends. So this is the James Bond of, of wildlife James trade. James Bond without the fast women and the fast cars. Um, but uh, it was, uh, yeah, using undercover techniques to, to get inside the trade to 
show what was happening. And what we were finding at the one end in Africa was that there would never be enough money to enforce your way out of this and with all kinds of problems with corruption and things like that at that end, which were sort of long-term institutional problems and, and, and cultural problems which need to be addressed over the long term. But at the other end in Asia, where a lot of the products were going like ivory, rhino horn, bear gall bladder, people had no idea of what was happening. So I had things like a rhino horn trader say to me, well, the rhino died of old age and someone's picking up the horn and I'm just kind of recycling it. So mm. what's the problem with that? And when you said to them, well, actually, look, the rhinos now are guided. They're guarded 24-7. Not only the rhinos being killed, but the rangers are being killed. The poachers are being killed. It's a war. People were generally shocked. And there was a big disconnect between the people buying the products yeah. uh, and, and, um, and what was happening in the field. And when they found out, they were, they were genuinely shocked. I think many people didn't know that an elephant had to die in order for the tusk some to be... Some people thought they grew back shark fin. You know, some people, I think it was like 40% said... Uh, uh, the fins grew back, so it was okay. Mm. And then even with shark fin, the mandarin is actually fish wing soup. So it doesn't even mention sharks. Mm. And people didn't, they thought it was a fish. Well, there's plenty of fish, so eating this is no problem at all. Sharks reproduce very slowly. So it was a massive gap in information. Um, and I think also the whole thing came from the attitude that uh, it wasn't that people were being malicious, which I think a lot of people, well, Asian people don't care about wildlife. And I'm like, well, I'm working there all the time and people actually really do care, but they have to have the right information or they don't know what to care about. Mm -hmm. And so there was this information gap and that's what we sought to do is to actually just connect people who are consuming to the products and the process they were going through, mm -hmm. um, working with cultural icons from those countries. And your fundamental message is actually the same as Jonathan's, and that is that you can make a difference. What is it, the slogan you use? Well, the, the slogan is when the buying stops, the killing can too. Uh, in Chinese, it's no killing, no buying. And it, it's getting back to the same issue. It's about the consumption. And, you know, we get to vote every so often, but we vote every time we make a purchase. You know, we, we vote the kind of world we want, the, the products we want, the, the chains. And, and it's connecting people with the responsibility is really what it's about. And then what we found, having done that and given the information, is that people generally responded very favorably once they had that information. Mm -hmm. So once the, the, the message is you, you stop buying, it stops happening, yeah. the messengers are who? Uh, well, we started with Jackie Chan, which was a good place to start. Um, <laughs> and then we also the, had Yao the Ming, actor and the, the actor, uh, movie Marshall. star, loved all over Asia from India. And in, strangely enough, he's very popular in Africa mm. because, uh, you know, you, you have people watching the TV and you don't really need much dialogue. And everybody loves Jackie Chan all around the world. And he was a great person to get involved and engaged. And um and He's Yao Ming is the, is the basketball player. So later on, Yao Ming, who, um, you know, people ask me, well, who is Yao Ming and how is he important in Chinese culture? And uh, there will only ever be one Yao Ming because Yao Ming's uh, success in the NBA was just as China was emerging as an international power. And he kind of symbolized the rise of China. And then, of course, he carried the flag in the Beijing Olympics, which is, you know, probably the most important event in China um, we, we will we'll be alive for. And so he has this unique, iconic... Um, Symbolism, as well as being seven foot six, which doesn't hurt either. He's an amazing figure physically and uh, also in his, his leadership. And uh, having these two icons, who I, I can't think of anyone who better we could have got, um, embrace these issues was just amazing. And so, so what had to be learned about uh, about rhino horn? What, what were the? I mean, I know it played a role in traditional medicine. What yeah. were the beliefs about rhino horn? What was the motivation for buying? Well, the first thing is these things change. I mean, we had a conversation earlier with the students asking questions, and they're saying, "Well, cultural culture is never static. Culture is always yeah. changing." So, traditionally, rhino horn was used as a fever reducer. And in very large quantities, rhino horn, as buffalo horn, does slightly reduce fevers. So it came from actually a, a, a basis. But of course, now we've got things that are very cheap and available that can reduce fever much more effectively. But what we found is that in the new economic boom, um, you know, suddenly rhino horn was an aphrodisiac, which it never was traditionally. Suddenly, in somebody in Vietnam says, oh, it cures cancer. And the word goes around, it cures cancer. So I've sat with the, the head of a, a TV network in Vietnam who said, I'm, I've got to confess something, I'm very sorry, but my father, five years ago, my father was dying of cancer. And these people came to me and said, the only thing that will save your father is rhino horn. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, now I know it's keratin, because from our campaigns, it's keratin like your fingernails. Of course it couldn't do it. I was stupid and I feel awful because not only did I not help my dad, but I also killed a rhino effectively. So um, the traditional beliefs became 
changed by marketing. And I liken it to, you know, the gold rush here where people were selling snake oil. And basically this stuff, for many people, it will do whatever you want it to do. The, the salesman will tell you. Mm -hmm. It's this. And the irony in Vietnam where they were selling it for a cancer cure was a lot of the time they were actually giving people buffalo horns. So even if they did believe it worked, which they didn't, <laughs> it was a con, they weren't even giving you the real thing anyway. Mm -hmm. So um, it was a pretty horrible uh, f scenario. And China actually banned uh, rhino horn in 1993 in traditional medicine. And traditional medicine started using a lot of different things and essentially moved on. And between 1993 and 2008, there was almost no rhino poaching in the world. Mm -hmm. So it's not the case that we've always had rhino poaching. In 2008, what changed was Vietnam came on the market. They started marketing it. It was being sold uh, in clubs to cure hangovers. So we think um, one of our theories is that the, the Vietnamese organized crime was sending amphetamines and, and heroin and, and trafficking women to Africa. And it wanted another product to send back the other way. Because very often with organized crime, it's best not to have cash. It's best to transfer mm -hmm. objects so that you don't have cash movements that can be tracked. So we think they s manufactured this demand for rhino horn in Vietnam with the cancer myth and with it being sold and distributed in clubs as a hangover cure. And so they resurrected this demand. So it wasn't a cultural old fashioned demand. It was a new demand that was being generated. So new demand gets generated in other ways, Jonathan, obviously. I, I, I always think of economic development as a, as, a, as a plus, if it can be made sustainable. Um, part of getting at the poaching is to provide other livelihoods Mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, in that sense, it, it is a positive thing. But do you see um, the problem just move? You know, in other words, as a middle class grows, the consumption of all kinds of things, including unsustainable consumption, happens. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the big worries, um, of course, is that um, and you, 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 know, you boil down these things, too. It's like the number of people and what we do, mm -hmm. right, is sort of our collective impact. Uh, but we have to recognize that a very small number of us have a massively disproportionate impact, and depending what it is. We in North America have a massively disproportionate impact on climate change because we're gluttons in energy use. Maybe less so with rhino horn. Now, Vietnam is kind of disproportionately large. So we have to kind of look at that. But um, one of the things that's really critical, as I mentioned before, is, um, again, energy use, but also our diets. Uh, if, you know, as we have about 2 billion people now joining a global middle class. We never had a global middle class before. We had a small number of very, very rich white people and a whole lot of very, very poor everybody else. And that was human history for far too long. But now we have a middle, which is, you know, probably be like $8,000 a year, kind of would be the global middle class, maybe 10, something like that. But this is China, it is the BRIC countries. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, China, a lot of Southeast Asia, a lot of countries you work in. And um, they're getting a global middle class. And so the diets they choose will steer the future of this planet. It'll determine whether there'll be rainforest on Earth or not. Uh, that's huge. What will happen to Indonesia and Malaysia's rainforest? is basically about oil, palm, and timber. So where is that going? Mm -hmm. um, in Brazil, it's about soybeans and beef, things like this. So the, um, the diets of Chinese middle-class people, for example, right. was driving a huge increase in meat consumption in China, fed by soybeans being grown in the United States and increasingly Brazil and Bolivia, grown in the Amazon. So increasing wealth in China was driving deforestation in the Amazon. Who knew? Welcome to globalization. Mm -hmm. So these things have, it's not just a wildlife trade, it's a trade in major commodities. This is gonna be a trade in water, virtual water, the water we use to grow our food or make our goods, and um, also energy goods. So this is gonna be a massive issue. And this is why at the same point, it's really about changing culture. It's if we just follow you know, the, well, this is the consumption mythos of the society we live in. This is what the markets are telling us, whether it's organized crime or TV, whatever. Um, we don't have to live that way. We can, cultures can change. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're going to have to do is, um, and I'm a scientist and I finally realized after a while the shortest distance to the world I want isn't because of we're limited by the science we have or the technology or the markets or the government instruments. It's really culture. It's just we haven't chosen to go to that world. So go, let's do it. And uh, you can do it. And you've shown well, this and others have too. And that's why I think, you know, we've quite said for quite a long time, we think China can actually be a leader in this because oh, yeah. when you, if I've been going backwards and forwards to China multiple years, multiple times a year. And 
the pace of change is just amazing. I mean, when the government decided to stop smoking in public places, Boom. you went from every <laughs> single taxi you got in reeking of smoke and every hotel reeking of smoke, it, it, it cleaned out completely. And there is a much more sense of collectiveness. And on the food issue, we were, uh, we were asked by the Chinese government, they like what we're doing on wildlife, which is largely public awareness campaigns to help with climate change. And we, one of the issues we've looked at is meat consumption. Yeah. And, um, but they were coming from it in actual fact from the health point of view, because with the increase in meat consumption and they're, they're projected to sort of you know, rival us in, in 20, by 2020, mm -hmm. um, if they do what the government's asking them to do, which is cut current consumption by 50%, that'll be responsible for 1% of all greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. um, but they were having health problems because suddenly diabetes, obesity, heart attacks, all these things, um, and they have an aging population. Mm -hmm. uh, these were going to be massive problems for them. So there are many other reasons to look at it, but it, it is going to take a, a cultural change. And basically what's happened is the rest of the world has adopted the Western model mm -hmm. uh, of consumption and consumerism. And it's not capable of, the planet's not capable of sustaining that with a, a Indian middle class, a Chinese middle class, and now it's going to be an African middle class as well yep. because Africa yep. population is projected to go from 1.5 uh, billion to 4 billion, and they are developing not in the old Western style model, which took decades, but the Chinese yep. model, which took a decade. Yep. <laughs> you know, and so it, it's great from the development point of view and pulling people out of poverty. That's the positive side of it. The, the negative side is it's already a depleted world that we have to, to get our resources from. And so we've got to work out a better model, a better way of developing. And the other issue, which I think isn't touched on, which has to be touched on, is inequality and yeah. the income distribution, because you can't have that situation. Uh, you know, you've got to have people having different lifestyles and things like that. It can't be rich and poor so close together. So that's another issue that we've got to address. And they're all related to resource allocation and what we use and aspirations, and we have to change our aspirations. It has to be less quality than just the quantity we've been going for. Yeah. Yeah. So, so one of the other modern realities is the mobility of people and the, the size of the diaspora. And as you were talking about, well, you were talking about how organized crime kind of has its tentacles everywhere, but there's also the fact that whole populations are going elsewhere and, mm -hmm. <coughs> and sending things home. I think of how many Chinese workers there are now in Africa and in Brazil and Latin America as a whole. Are they, are, are they driving some of the consumption and sending things home? Absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, the, it, there's been massive construction in Africa um, funded by China, and some of it's really good. There's better roads than there ever been before, but there's also individuals in some of those companies that are buying ivory, buying rhino horn. In some cases, I think they're just being approached because they're, oh, Chinese yeah. and Chinese buy ivory, so let's go and sell to them. But that's definitely been a, a, a major problem. And in fact, we, when we took Yao Ming for the documentary. We had a, a school teacher, a school we visited next to a, a reserve, and the teacher said to Yao Ming, he said, please, Please, Mr. Yaming, please tell China we're very grateful for the road that you're building, but why do Chinese people steal the ivory from us and kill our elephants? And, mm -hmm. you know, Yao was really moved by that, but uh, he said, you know, these people don't understand. And, and so that's definitely been part of it. It's also part of the rapid economic development. You've got things like the train uh, going through Nairobi National Park, for example. But, you know, at the same time, Africa wants to develop. They want to get better livelihoods for people. You can't stop development, but you've got to try and find some kind of balance where I think if Asia could turn around and, and have it all happen again, they had very economic, rapid economic development, which has been great in terms of incomes, but they destroyed a lot of the wildlife in the process, mm -hmm. particularly in China. And the Chinese government now is setting up a lot of big reserves and trying to repopulate the wildlife. And I think if they had their time again, they'd say, we wish we'd kept these bits at the same time and set aside land for wildlife and kept that so we don't have to try and rebuild it. Um, so there are lessons to be learned, and, and I think um, we can learn a lot of lessons from China, and I, I hope that China can become a, a leader, not just in the development side, but also how we keep those other things going. Mm -hmm. So as you think about sort of elephants coming from, from mostly at least the ones, the sources of the ivory coming from Africa, uh, rhinos, rhino horns coming from, from Africa, who's who's doing the killing and who's doing the selling? What's that that supply chain look like? Well, very often, I mean, it used to be that we used to think of poachers um, as very poor local people 
Uh, it seems to be more now they're more organized criminals. So in a lot of cases, it's not the people in the surrounding villages that are doing the poaching. And very often, they're your best allies in stopping poaching. Um, it's people coming in, and it's organized crime. And um, uh, the, the selling is then done usually by local middlemen, but increasingly there's uh, Chinese or Vietnamese in Africa acting as middlemen. Um, and from there, it's shipped by all kinds of routes. I mean, one of the most popular mechanisms recently has been to get a huge log from a, a big hardwood tree and hollow it out and stick ivory inside the log and then mm. seal the log back up. Mm. Um, and there's been a bunch of seizures done like that. Sometimes it's being smuggled in uh, tea and coffee consignments and all this. And the volume of trade is obviously massive with uh, container loads going in. So the detection is very hard. And thankfully, people are shifting away from the sort of you know, casual inspection to intelligence-based work, which is really the way to go in, in terms of enforcement, to sort of infiltrate these networks and work out who the people are. And in, there's been a lot more prosecutions recently. So last year was actually a record year for ivory seizures in places like Malaysia and Vietnam, but we think the trade was actually going down. It's just there's never been any seizures in, in uh, Vietnam before. So. Now, we have a law here when it comes to ivory. Yeah. Uh, was that 2016? When, when was it an Obama? Well, yeah. we've, we've, we've strengthened the laws. There's been laws for quite a long time, mm -hmm. but uh, Obama, in partnership with President Xi, um, they both banned the ivory sales. Yeah. And that was, uh, came in the beginning of this year in China last year. Yeah. And you played a role in that on the, Ch on the Chinese side. Did you not? We did. We were, we were largely working with Yao Ming. So Yao Ming is actually um, a member of the National People's Congress, which mm -hmm. uh, every year meets and you relate, uh, people are able to put forward resolutions. And Yao Ming put forward a resolution asking the Chinese government to ban the ivory trade. And the U.S. government uh, under, under President Obama was very good because they didn't point the finger at China and say, you're the bad guys. They said, we have a problem too. Let's solve it together, which is always the approach the Chinese like. And um, yeah, the two countries put the, the ban in. And the good news is that um, even just the announcement of the ban, the price of ivory fell from about 2,100 a kilo to about $700 a kilo. Mm -hmm. So the price went down to a third. The seizures into China went down by 80%. Um, and I was just in Kenya 10 days ago. And uh, some of you might have been to Daphne Sheldrick's orphanage where she has the tiny baby elephants, the orphans there. And I went and I said, oh, your orphans are all looking a bit big. And they said, well, we haven't had an orphan come in for three years. Hmm. So hmm. the poaching in, in Kenya hmm. went from four, 390 elephants four years ago down to 60 this year. Yeah, yeah. And, and the ivory, the carving of ivory has gone down too. There's sort of yeah, I mean, you that, know, the, that whole industry. We had a meeting a few months ago in China. And it was quite interesting because the ivory, they had ivory carvers there. And the ivory carvers, I mean, a lot of the stuff has just been cheap, tacky stuff, frankly, uh, chopsticks or, or cheap commercial stuff. The, the real craftsmen of ivory are like, well, we, we're going to keep working in museums. We're going to keep working, uh, restoring stuff and things. So we're mm -hmm. going to actually stay in business. And they weren't actually too upset, the real craftsmen. Um, but the, the commercial element has gone down a bit. There's still stuff going on through the internet, but all the retail outlets have stopped. So it's much harder to find ivory now in China. Yeah. Now, elephants are lovable. Um, they're not only magnificent, but they're intelligent. What mm -hmm. do we know about them, their problem-solving skills, their capacity for empathy. What do we know about elephants? Well, we know it's tough because when, when they raid crops, it's really hard to stop them raiding crops because <laughs> they know all kinds of things like this electric fence, they'll drop a tree on top of it to get through. So <laughs> they're very tough elephants. Um, I think the thing that's, that's sort of impressive about them, I think you, when you see them and you, you, you know, and thankfully there's still places where you can look a wild elephant in the eye and you can see the intelligence in there but they are one of the few species that kind of mourns their dead where they they come and find bones from elephants they'll play with them and sort of look at them they have a sort of self-consciousness about it um so they're definitely very 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 smart animals very um caring and in a social group and we've seen with the the elephant orphanage is that uh the keepers when they have these elephants come in the babies they have to sleep with them at night because otherwise they're so scared and lonely, but just the company of their keeper is enough to keep mm. them going. Mm. So and they are remarkable animals. So it's easy for, for us to, to care about elephants. Right. Are you finding the same kind of empathy when it comes to matta rays or, or, <laughs> or sharks or even rhinos? Is, is that a harder, a harder task for nonprofits to mobilize public support around? I think it's probably harder to fundraise for, but I think in terms of the protection, um, Again, it's come on leaps and bounds. So, you know, one of the animals we're working a lot on now is pangolins. And does everyone know what a pangolin is? Does anyone not know what a pangolin is? 
Go on, describe well, we it. Not, yes. not too bad. We've yeah. got four or five hands coming up here. But, but, you know, 10 years ago, probably nobody would have known what a pangolin is. And so they're scaly anteaters, a bit like armadillos, but actually extremely cute little animals. But um, they're actually the most heavily trafficked mammal in the world mm -hmm. in terms of numbers. And in Africa, you know, hardly anyone's seen them because they're nocturnal and they usually <laughs> underground and come out at night. Um, but, they, you know, a few years ago, probably 15 years ago, it would have been very hard to get people behind pangolins. But now... Um, what we're finding is that people, once they've got the notion that it's wrong to consume these animals, it translates from one species to the other. So yeah. whether it's the sharks, which shark fin consumption, the, the imports are down 80% in China in the last three years, of shark fin consumption, and you'd think sharks would be difficult to get people to empathize with. But I think they understand now. There's a, a more sophisticated public understanding these are part of an ecosystem, they're part of a functioning thing, and it doesn't have to be cute to be important to save. So the last time uh, some Chinese officials were caught eating a pangolin, um, there was 7 million responses on social media condemning these guys mm. and saying they should be locked up and all that. Mm. So the, the world has somewhat moved on in its sophistication in terms of it doesn't have to be Bambi to be lovable. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, Jonathan, what you specialize is in is the interconnection amongst issues, not only amongst species, but amongst issues as well. You've, you've, uh, when, when you were an academic, you, mm -hmm. you ran interdisciplinary programs. I want to know in the world of sort of immobilizing, in the world of, 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 of politics, are we able to walk and chew gum at the same time? Do we, so I, I, I have to say, I'm influenced by somebody who just came up to me a couple of days ago and said, climate change is the single most important problem and nobody should be working on any other. And I kept thinking, well, there is, we can do no, more than one at yeah, once. Yeah. Do you find that um, <coughs> there are issues that, that tend to trump others? Um, well, that's a, that's a fascinating question. Um, well, first of all, I, I think uh, civilizations that want to succeed have to learn how to walk and chew gum at the same time and maybe even juggling a few things while they're doing it. That's called running a civilization. Uh, we seem to be able to do all sorts of nonsensical things at the same time. Maybe we could do some good <laughs> things at the same time. Uh, so I would like to believe we can make people's lives better and healthier and uh, preserve the future of our biosphere at the same time. And there's nothing stopping us except us. So uh, I actually am very optimistic that we could do that. Um, one of the things that's fascinating, too, about how quickly cultures can change, to getting back to your point, you know, like... Um, I was talking to, I was talking to my, my daughter about this the other day, and I said, you know, when I was growing up when I was your age, you know, so oh, back in the Stone Ages or something, like, no, not <laughs> that long ago, but long enough. Um, everything I was taught as a kid that could never happen, not only did happen, it was inevitable. It was like the end of apartheid. That will never happen. Of course mm -hmm. it did. Uh, the end of the Soviet Union. Of course it did. The, uh, you know, gay marriage, an African-American president. These are all things I was taught were impossible when I was a child. So, you know, Think about that for a minute. Mm. So I like to, you know, the human capacity for change is enormous. So, um, but we have to get better at focusing on some of the bigger issues. This is where I do believe, though, the environmental community, sometimes we need to step back and look for the big leverage points. And that's, mm -hmm. I call them like planet levers. You know, if you, it, there's this guy, uh, Archimedes, in ancient Greek, he <laughs> wrote once, uh, if you want to move the, he was, a, he was a physicist, he wrote, you know, give me a lever and a place to stand and I can move the world. And uh, that influenced me when I first read that. So yeah, we need to find those kind of mm -hmm. leveraged uh, kind of systems. And to me, they're, you know, for if you want to talk about climate change, habitat loss, preserving our lands and waters, and keeping the environment clean for the future, food waste is the first thing we should stop yeah. with. Yeah. Uh, then we get to think about like energy efficiencies. We get to think about water efficiency. You know, and these are easy. Um, these are all, it, by the way, everything I mentioned is basically one simple rule. Stop being stupid. You know, <laughs> we don't have to break the laws of physics. We just have to stop wasting 40% of the food we grow. Stop, the Israelis use one-tenth the amount of water we do in California to grow the same amount of food. We use one-tenth the same amount of water as they use in India to grow the same amount of food. So between India and Israel, there's a 100-fold difference and how much irrigation water it takes to grow one gram of rice. Hmm. Hundredfold. There are massive opportunities for us to be smarter, better, without compromising our yeah. future aspirations. Yeah. This is the thing. Sustainability doesn't have to be a downer. Oh, by the way, we've got to change the word. Uh, can, is, are there any marketing people here? Or uh, I hope so. Okay, we need you. God, we need you <laughs> in the environmental business. Because when we, we think the best thing we can go for is sustainable. I'm like... 
if I went up to you and said, hey, how's your marriage? You said, oh, it's sustainable. <laughs> I'd be like, oh, God, I'm so sorry. That sucks. You know, I mean, like, you know, that's terrible. But can we come up with something better, like thriving or great or awesome? Or, you know, I mean, can we please come up with a better word? Because we need to aspire to something better. And this is where I think the environmental community, we've done a somewhat poor job of this. Uh, I think we need to change cultures by going for the most noble version of ourselves. I've never met anybody. I don't care who they voted for, a red state, blue state, small town, big city. I don't care. Everyone I've ever met, and probably you've ever met too, wants a better future for their children and for the people that come after us. I've never met anybody who says, ah, screw them. I never met them. Have you? And if we just ask ourselves, what would it take to get to that better future? But it turns out it's kind of surprising. A lot of it's good for us. A lot of it is totally doable. A lot of it is doable right now. And we just have to kind of get up and do it. And a lot of the things we just heard about the wildlife trade, hey, the world didn't end because people realized that, you know, rhino horn doesn't cure cancer. It's a fingernail on some animal's head. You know, come on. Same thing, like wasting energy isn't good for the economy. Wasting water is not good for the economy. I mean, hello. So I think we need to shift... Uh, to focusing on the big things, but put it in a more positive light and hit our aspirations rather than our fears. And uh, I'm sorry to go on about this, but one of the things that we often do in the environmental community is we often, we want to hit our base. We, we do scary things. We'll put up, like there are two movies about climate change last year. Al Gore did one, Leo DiCaprio did the other. I've worked in this stuff for 30 years and it scared the hell out of me because they were designed to. They were designed to scare the activists and the donors, which is about 12% of the American population might identify with those values. But it pissed off 12% of America who listens to Rush Limbaugh and it left 76% of Americans hiding under their beds. Mm -hmm. That's not where we gotta go. We gotta find ways to be positive, talk about solutions, about hope, about possibility, and really about envisioning a future where we can thrive. And that's gonna be a fantastic place and we can get there. And I think you avoid fear and shame, don't you, we, in we, your we, approach? We throw in a bit of fear and shame occasionally, but um, <laughs> usually we also use comedy and we, we yep. do, it's very aspirational. You know, one, one person, uh, we did surveys on our stuff and we, we make a lot of 30 second messages and they very high production value featuring stars and CGI stuff and yeah. all this stuff. And um, one person said to us, oh, this is no good. This is like a Nike ad. I'm like, Nike Perfect. ads actually work very, very well for Nike. And yeah. so, you know, I, I keep saying to people is that, you know, we are trying to create a brand and the brand is an aspirational brand, exactly. which is you're going to be on the right team, which is not buying a shark fin suit because people like Yao Ming and Jackie Chan, they're all part of this brand and you want to be part of that brand. And so um, the, the, what we're trying to do is reduce demand, but we're doing it not in the fear way. We're doing it in the aspiration ways. So you want to be on the right team, the right what, guys, the cool people are doing this. That, oh, I'm sorry, you said, yeah. I, I love this because on climate change, we're trying to do the same thing with Planet Vision. We're trying to like depoliticize this or departisanize this and say, wow, when you work on climate change, you're joining the same team as Elon Musk and Pope Francis and Michael Bloomberg and Arnold Schwarzenegger, mo by the way, most of whom are conservatives and Republicans I just mentioned. And like, don't you want to be on that team? I think any team that includes Elon Musk and Pope Francis probably is going to be pretty good. You know, I, I want to be on that team. And, you know, like, or Yao Ming. I want to be on, well, and Jackie Chan for, uh, yeah. And there's some, there's some very basic <laughs> psychological things going on, which is yeah. that, you know, you can't always be negative because it turns yeah. people off. So we try and sugarcoat our message with special effects and mm -hmm. funny things and, and the stars to be able to repeat it again and again. So people find it engaging rather than, oh, I want to turn this off because I'm depressed. Yeah. And you're giving people the mechanism. What do you do? And, you know, we started off saying, Saying, don't buy it but now we're saying tell your friends and family not so there's something else you can do you can be sure. active and you can be part of the solution so I think um, it's hard because I think it's partly the way the media portrays these things and well, you know the, the the big thing I find very frustrating here is that it's always got to be a conflict and it's always yeah. got to be two people fighting and disagreeing and usually nobody is there the journalists are not doing the role of saying well actually this guy is completely wrong on their facts and yeah. this person is right they just say well one person says this and one person says that and so it's, it's confusing, I think, for the public. And confusion works for the other side because it maintains the status quo. And a lot of it is just trying to get uh, through that confusion. Well, and one other, sorry to add to this, but it, it's one of the things that's so important in this country right now, though I think it's a global issue too, but especially in the US right now. Uh, rates of anxiety in America today and fear are higher than they've ever been uh, and are, that we've ever measured. We've been measuring this stuff for over a century. Mm -hmm. And also our, you know, the, um, 
feeling of division in this country is higher than it's been since the Civil War. Uh, a really funny statistic, though, is that even though we feel more divided, we are unified in one thing. It turns out 80% of Americans agree, 80% of us, the vast majority of Americans agree on one thing, we are more divided than ever. <laughs> uh, you know, that's bizarre, but it's true. So uh, things that continue to polarize you know, and drive wedges between people, this is exactly what the media and politicians want. But if you actually want to solve a problem and go beyond paralysis, that's exactly what you shouldn't do. And so finding bridges, finding ways for people to, to share and kind of rise above this artificial division. We're being manipulated you know, by media mm -hmm. and by politicians mm -hmm. very deliberately, very consciously to incite paralysis. I mean, don't fall for it. We're not as divided right. as we think we are. Right. Most of us actually share common beliefs, and we can get there. The part of what is done in, in this field is to give folks the opportunity to do the right thing. You think about, um, in, in recent years, there's been a focus on how uh, various companies can make social change, advancing the social good, kind of intrinsic to the value chain. Um, some of my reading and preparing for tonight, Peter learned that Sotheby's stopped selling um, uh, wildlife <coughs> products before before they were banned. Right. So it took a choice like that. Are you finding, as part of your work, are you looking at sort of airline carriers, uh, you know, the, the, the various yeah. intermediaries along the way yeah. that can actually get ahead of the law and, and do the right thing? We, I was involved in um, getting the, the import of wild birds to this country for the pet trade reduced from about a million to about 20,000 a year. And a large part of that campaign was persuading 150 airlines not to carry these yeah. birds in so they couldn't ship it. And then we go to the politicians and say, look, the airlines aren't carrying it. How can you be allowing this to go on when the commercial interests are getting out? You're behind the curve. So I think you know, legislation and, and private action sort of go hand in hand. And if, you, if the private sector is moving, the politicians will sometimes follow mm -hmm. behind. And unfortunately, that's the way it's been going. It would be nice if it should be the other way around because they're supposed to be looking after the long-term future. But unfortunately, it's so short-term now, the whole politics. And it's again where a country like China can maybe take a longer-term view than the seven years elected. Mm -hmm. They can take a longer-term view and maybe make some more sensible long-term uh, yeah. solutions. And part of our role is to reward those companies that do choose to get ahead of, uh, mm -hmm. of the issue mm -hmm. as well. You, as you were talking about sustainability and um, uh, uh, Jonathan, I got question cards that asked about sustainability, but focused on sustainable fishing. And the question of, or should we be, uh, one questioner even asked, is it moral to still be fishing? Mm -hmm. um, but talk a little bit about our oceans and um, the sustainability of our, our approach to, to them. Yeah, well, uh, so the oceans continue to provide an enormous share of the animal protein we eat on this planet uh, and will need to um, for a long time. There's not going to be a replacement of that. Um, and the morality of that, I guess, is balanced. On the humans um, do benefit from small amounts of animal protein. I think a lot of us in the world eat too much. Some people in the world maybe have too little. Uh, plant protein can go a long way, though, and we should do as much as we can there. Uh, aquaculture, though, is the fish farms, if you will, uh, have actually been a, uh, a, are now a bigger source of animal protein from the oceans than uh, open fishing has become. So if aquaculture, fish farms, are more than half of the fish eaten on the planet. Uh, at first, the idea was fish farms would be adding protein to the world's food supply because we're growing more fish. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's reducing the global supply of food because the fish we grow in these fish farms are usually carnivores that need to eat other fish. So we go out on the open ocean, harvest fish, grind them up so we can feed them to salmon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And or to um, what else would there be? Uh, salmon, um, shrimp, things like that. These are very popular. Tilapia, on the other hand, you know, we, we, should, we shouldn't be eating carnivores because that meant they got to eat a whole bunch of herbivores before we can eat them. So we could eat lower on the food chain. If we're going to eat animals, eat ones that eat plants. Mm -hmm. Rule of thumb when it comes to food, the closer you get to the sun, the better off we're going to be. So eat your plants or eat a little bit of animal protein if you still want to and much less of the red stuff. So Did you want to add something? Yeah, there's another issue about sustainability of fishing. And, and a lot of the unsustainability mm. of fishing is the mechanisms we use to fish. Oh, absolutely. Yes. And here's, you know, you were talking <clears throat> earlier about a better solution. So 
you know, no matter what people are telling us, the jobs that are being lost are not being lost to immigration, they're being lost to automation largely. Mm -hmm. yep. Automation is taking jobs away from people. Fishing industry is a classic one, where we have these massive automated trawlers and things like that going out. Um, you know, if we were fishing by more traditional methods, rod and pole, and much more selective, which reduced the bycatch of turtles and all these things, higher quality of uh, product and things like that, we could provide a hundred times more jobs in the fishing industry and we'd have more sustainable fisheries and we'd have less bycatch and all this so mm -hmm. you know there's again something where we could have the same thing by changing the industry and making it less automated we could have a much more sustainable fisheries one other thing uh, getting back to fishing too is um so there's kind of the overall demand curve the technology we use but also uh, there's a bit of the advance of what are called marine protected areas areas are kind of set aside like you know hey let the ocean recover here uh, coastal marine protected areas seem to be very, very, very uh, effective so far. We have them in California. They're in other places. This is good. Uh, there are also vast areas of the ocean that have been designated in the open high seas as marine protected areas. But what's been noted lately, actually by a scientist at the Cal Academy, Luis Roca, is that, yeah, these are like the ocean's deserts. These were areas there were no fish anyway. And politicians get to declare, hey, we made Antarctica a giant park. Like, great, nobody was there. Um, you know, so there are parts of the ocean that are vast area, but we need to kind of make sure they're in the right places too. So, we, so it's demand, technology, but also policy. Uh, we can't let politicians kind of make a marine protected area where there was no fishing in the first place. That's okay, but we need to put them in the high pressure areas, but also the kind of, um, uh, also the illegal fishing that's happening in many places as well. Though that's going to be harder and harder to do as high resolution satellites are now beginning to track the oceans on a daily yeah. basis. Uh, a company here in San Francisco, for example, called Planet Labs, it will probably make it impossible to do illegal fishing within the next year. Mm -hmm. uh, and they'll be giving that technology away to the world, I think. So which is pretty exciting. Yeah. So, so there are some students in the audience, and w one of them asks uh, in, in one of these question <coughs> cards, what, what is the, sort of the, the, the line of work he or she should be going into as you look at, if you want to make a big difference in these issue areas, um, when, when it comes to the environment broadly, but also wildlife uh, more focused, um, if it takes interdisciplinary knowledge and skill, yeah, yeah. what should I be studying? What should I be headed for? Uh, well, I think the, the thing is, from my point of view, I'm an economist that ended up being a marketer and God knows what. So I'm not <laughs> probably the right person to ask, but, uh, you know, it's going to be about humans. You know, you know, wildlife, a lot of people study biology to help animals, but actually... If you're going to help animals, it's all about human interaction. So whether it's social change, uh, you know, alternative income generation, um, uh, or, or, you know, we've mentioned, I mean, it's uh, how do we market sustainability? How do we make it more attractive? Mm -hmm. um, I think that ultimately our world is governed by economics and, and the, the sort of... Uh, the, the the system as it is and we're going to have to change the system uh to get uh, to sustainability so you know it might be politics it might be uh marketing it's not necessarily the direct discipline that you want to be in i think yeah. is it all about systems change and understanding systems when you see them absolutely I mean, uh, and getting to the student's question more directly i totally agree with this and um i was a professor for like 20 years and I got this question every year, uh, all the time. And I finally found out the answer was like, look at an actual ecosystem. And, you know, there are organisms that are just really, really good at what they do. So I'd ask that student, ask the question, what are you really good at? Mm -hmm. Do that. Do it beautifully. Do it better than anybody. Don't think, you know, if you're a really good panther that you should become a boa constrictor. Be the panther, you know, that's cool. <laughs> that's your job, you know. So if you're great at engineering, be an engineer. Mm -hmm. You're great at law, be a lawyer. Great, that's cool. But be an ecosystem participant. And we humans, we don't build good ecosystems. We build zoos. And we put the scientists all in one cage and put them over here. Then we put the engineers in some cage over there and the policymakers here and the marketing people there. They don't mix. They don't talk to each other. That's not an ecosystem. So the analogy, I guess, would be like, find your niche, whatever you love. Make sure you find joy in it, and you're, you don't have to be good at it, but at least that you love doing it. Uh, so find your passion. But then make sure you travel in unusual circles, because the economist will turn into a marketing guy who turns into saving you know, animals around the world. I'm a physicist by training, and I'm working on like, I'm running a cultural institution, and what, what the hell? Um, you know, I spend more time talking to marketing people than I ever do physicists nowadays. So it's just, that's the way it is. So travel in unusual circles, and it's about boundary crossing. Uh, especially among different kinds mm -hmm. of institutions. It isn't just the academic disciplines. Mm -hmm. 
but God, whatever you do, don't become a professor or something. That's what I did. <laughs> Get the hell out of the ivory tower and cross boundaries between mm -hmm. academia, business, mm -hmm. nonprofits, civil society, government and governance organizations. Uh, we need people who are really good at connecting all those together because nobody has the answer with a capital A. And sorry to tell you students, no one of you uh, individually are gonna save the world all by yourself. Um, a lot of us have tried in the past, nobody's done it. So um, we need to, it's a team sport. Get good at it and you know, figure out who your team players are and they're gonna be from different walks of life than you and that's great. Another question we have is speaking of crossing boundaries, Peter, this is more about crossing cultures uh, and geographic uh, boundaries as well. To what degree uh, does your organization, just Wild Aid, but do other organizations in your field um, work with local communities to gain a sense of what their values are mm -hmm. um, as you think through what your strategy might be and how they might mm -hmm. play in that strategy? We, we tend to be for the nature of our work, we tend to be like a macro organization that's working on a country or overall. But we do, you know, we get to meet a lot of people in the field in the course of our work. So um, one of my great pleasures now is I've, I've done a lot of work in the markets where I've looked at a lot of dead animals and parts of dead animals, which is pretty damn depressing if you love animals. But I'm going to do a lot more work now in Africa and uh, working with communities there um, and working with local people there. And one of the big things that hits you, first of all, is in Africa, many people from the middle class, and there is quite a big middle class in Africa, have never been to their own national parks. So these places we pay thousands of dollars to travel around the world to go and see, people living like 20 miles away from them have not ever been to see. And one of my great pleasures is being able to take people now. We're taking religious leaders. We took a, a group of religious leaders in Tanzania um, and many of them had never seen an elephant before. Uh, and we went out and we had this beautiful sunset in, in Tarangiri and I said, uh, I, we had the Muslims and the evangelists and all these different groups there, the Catholic bishops and all this. I said, one of you's got a direct line in because this is an incredible view we're seeing here with these beautiful elephants all coming up in front of us. Um, and they were, we then had an evening reception and they were sort of almost outbidding each other in condemning the poaching that was going on mm. from a moral point of view. Mm. And so that was wonderful to see them get engaged in this issue from their different perspectives. Um, and then, you know, spending time in, in some of the villages and talking to the people about what's going on from, from your point of view. And then you realize that, you know, for many of the, the, the tribes in Africa, they actually have a clan which is related to an animal totem. So there's the hyena clan and there's the elephant clan. And, you know, with Yao Ming, they actually made him a, a, an honorary warrior and named him after one of their historical figures that had come and saved their race to say, we need you to save the elephants for us because the mm -hmm. elephants bring us income. They're paying for our schools. They're paying for our health care. Will you be our, our, our savior? And this honorary winery. So that was wonderful too. So, you know, again, a lot of what we do is on the marketing and the higher end of things, but um, it's always wonderful to connect with people at the grassroots and really realize that, um, you know, nature is something which has an appeal and has a, a wonder to, to people every age and every culture around the world. I know in Rwanda, where with those wonderful uh, preservation of the gorillas, mm -hmm. um, in, in the communities around the national park, serve as guides. Yeah. Uh, they note that uh, the, the tur tourism industry is based entirely yeah. on these gorillas. Um, and they are the great greatest um, uh, sort of bulwark against right. poaching. Uh, Absolutely. But it's also lovely to take people and school children things to actually go and see these animals that are literally there, but they've only ever seen them as potentially a nuisance or a, a something to be scared of. And you mm -hmm. actually go in, in the safari capacity yeah. in a vehicle and they come right up to you and seeing people go through that transition is, is an amazing thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So talk about some some good news. We've seen um, not that you have already, but we've seen. Um, tigers come back in, in certain places in India. Talk about where, where you've seen uh, a turnaround in what, what looked like a certain extinction. Yeah, well, I mean, the, you know, the elephants in 1989 were looking like they're going down the tubes, and now in many places uh, they're coming back. And, uh, you know, I th we're not that far away, I don't think, from now being able to translocate um, elephants back into areas they've been made extinct from. Once you make mm. them safe, you can do that. There's quite a lot of that work going on now where entire parks in places like Mozambique, they're bringing back the wildlife and reconstituting it. 
Um, the same with rhinos. The rhinos have, have come back in some cases. Uh, there were like three and a half thousand, now five thousand black rhino. The white rhino, the southern white rhino, was down to fifty individuals in the nineteen mm fifties, -hmm. and it's back up to twenty thousand now. So, wow. if we can stop the poaching, the case of rhinos' habitat is less less critical than many species. They can come back and do quite nicely. Thank you. So, you know, it, it's possible to rebuild this, and it's possible to also see how so many of the African countries now are realizing the value and the tremendous um, you know, uh, income they can get, like Rwanda. Rwanda's been restocking its parks and building them up again because they're seeing these as investments. Um, and so you know, there is some hope out, there's some good things happening. The overall way of the world is, is, is somewhat depressing and, and negative, but um, you see these beacons of hope and the, you see awareness going up, you see the valuation of these things happening, whether it's sustainable fisheries as well. You know, we work in the Galapagos Islands and some of that technology we've invested in and there used to be 10,000 sharks, you know, poached a year and now that it's stopped because the price has gone down, protection's got better. So you can see solutions to these things, as, as you, you've mentioned earlier. Um, it's just about the will, uh, the political will to get it done mm -hmm. and the public will to push the politicians to, to solve these things. So there is hope. And I think um, uh, when you realize that this could be part of development as opposed to its versus development, then you can see the way forward. Mm -hmm. We've been talking a lot about Asia as mostly as consumers and, and uh, Africa as the source of the animals. What about Latin America? You think about, well, you, you talked about wild birds. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Monkeys at, at mm -hmm. some point were imported in large numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, cats, jaguars. Mm -hmm. What is, uh, as you look at Latin America, what are the, the big trouble spots when it comes to wildlife preservation? Well, it's the habitat again, it's a lot of it. And you know, mm -hmm. we talked about palm oil and I've seen in areas that you know somebody de exactly what you said they designated a national park and someone in the audience said well that's now all a palm oil plantation it took five years to designate it and when you've done it mm -hmm. it's been converted to palm oil mm -hmm. so again it's habitat destruction there's problems with fisheries again being overfished um, you know again you're seeing governments and people getting up behind this we've had tremendous support in Ecuador we've done a lot of work we had a the Ecuadorian soccer team uh, so play fair with sharks when they scored a goal they do a little shark fin dance to tell people not to kill the sharks and things mm -hmm. so um, uh, you know the challenge is largely habitat loss but even Jaguar now we're seeing some trade in bones and skins as a replacement for tiger bones so mm -hmm. on the hopeful so. side though and like um in Brazil, there was uh, it's the Mayor Road more recently, but um, in the mid 2000s, uh, nobody thought deforestation rates in Brazil were going to go down. They dropped by over 70 percent in five years, and from a climate change point of view, that would be like taking every car in America and turning them off forever. Uh, that's not a bad thing, and that happened mainly because uh, commodity supply chains around soybeans and beef started to get more scrutiny yeah. from environmental groups and. To, uh, a lot of 80-20 rules like this. Half of the deforestation on the planet happens in two countries, Brazil and Indonesia, at least during the 2000s, and for four supply chains, soybeans and beef in Latin America mostly, palm oil and timber in Indonesia mostly. So you get four supply chains, two countries, and about a dozen companies responsible for 80% of that trade, uh, including companies like Bungie, ADM, Cargill, and others. And those big Western public companies, some of them are private, but it's mostly publicly traded, they would have, you know, um, you know, um, I don't know, Greenpeace protesting their board meetings, and nobody likes that. I mean, people think profits are what drive companies. Like, no. <laughs> board members drive companies. If you want to piss off board members and make your point, that'll change the company. So they don't want to be protested. They don't want their lives turned into hell. So suddenly, these companies started cleaning up their act, not perfectly. And then groups like the Nature Conservancy would come in and try to help. Hey, let's design a way of growing soybeans that doesn't cause deforestation. Let's work on the land that's already there. Mm -hmm. There's been some problems in leakage where it's not happening perfectly, but that was a big win, huge win. And most Americans had no idea it even happened. And it was one of the most hopeful things from a biodiversity point of view, but also from a climate change point of view. Protecting rainforest is a double win uh, from you know biodiversity and all the creatures that live in them more than any other ecosystems except coral reefs, but also they lock up a lot of carbon out of the air and continue to do so if you leave them alone. Not to mention what they do for local watersheds and local communities if you preserve them. Very good things. So that's a really top priority. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of companies, I do want to take you, uh, Peter, to one last point, and that is now we've got online sales mm -hmm. of things. Yeah. To what extent are tech companies working with you mm -hmm. um, to help with that problem? 
They are, uh, both in China and here, um, and they've been pretty responsive in wanting to do it. The trouble is, is that, um, you know, the, the traders shift. So, you know, you put in a thing that says you can't put on ivory and they start calling it white gold instead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so and, and the big problem is the sort of anonymity of the thing that, you know, the, they're now using uh, WhatsApp in, in Vietnam where they've changed the laws now and cracked down on it. Um, instead of having a shop where you go and it's there, they will actually WhatsApp you the picture of the rhino horn and, you know, you don't know where it is, so it's harder to go and catch it and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So um, the companies have been pretty responsive, but uh, it definitely makes the game of law enforcement harder. Yeah. Mm. And then finally, um, uh, Jonathan mentioned several environmental groups that are doing work. Are there organizations that uh, partner with you in particular or, or going after the same goal? We, we partner almost every one of our projects. We're partnered with people like World Wildlife Fund, the Nature mm -hmm. Conservancy you've mentioned, uh, uh, WCN. There's a whole load of great organizations out there. And, um, right. you know, I think everyone thinks we're all competing. But generally speaking, I think we know when they've got a common goal, we want to work on something and it makes sense. We all work together uh, in the right way. Mm -hmm. Well, there's one. Um, we could do more, though, because uh, it turns out Americans spend about $80 billion a year uh, funding environmental organizations. That's really good. If we can make them just 10 percent better. That'd be eight billion dollars worth of new act, and that's real money. Mm -hmm. And so I love to see the environmental groups collaborating more. But if we could kind of reduce some of the duplication of effort, finding streamlines, finding ways to leverage that activity, and also to share their stories better, I think we can get that ten percent headroom out of great organizations that already exist. So mm -hmm. it's great to see collaboration. But I think we had to push that a little bit more because that's like a couple of Bill Gates right there. You know, that's worth it. <laughs> and a lot of them, they'll bring, bring their own comparative advantage. I mean, exactly. that's what's interesting. You've got your strategy. It's focused yeah. on the demand side. Well, and, uh, Others are focused on the supply and, and side. A bit of competition isn't a bad thing. It's what powers the capitalist economy. And yeah, so, you know, I think sometimes, but yeah, if, as long as it's not duplicative, it doesn't make yeah. any sense. But if people, I mean, people said, oh, there's another organization working in China. I'm like, it's 1.4 billion people. <laughs> yeah. We need another 20 organizations working in China, please, exactly. you know. Yeah. Well, Peter, Jonathan, thank you so much thank for you much. sharing your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you.